So as I said, today we're going to be dis discussing no recourse to public funds. And this session really aims to be yeah. a bit of a discussion starter for an area of council's work, which is sadly still widely misunderstood. Um, it's often patchy and yet it has huge human and financial costs. We've got a really busy agenda, so we're just going to jump straight in. And I'm going to hand over to Lucy from Compass, who's going to set the scene for us a little and talk about the recently published um, comprehensive research um, and understanding migrant destitution. So over to you, Lucy. Thanks. Thanks, Rosie, for the intro. And thanks for inviting us here today. Um, bear with me one moment whilst I bring up my slides. And sorry, just a quick one, just if everyone could make sure you're on mute if you're not speaking. Perfect. Thanks. Great. Um, just double check everyone can see my slides. Does that come up? Yep. Fab. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, so we're going to be talking about our, a piece of research that Compass has just published last month called Understanding Migrant Destitution in the UK, which essentially is an overview of kind of local authority um, provision around NRPF across the country and it essentially builds on a report that we did uh, back in 2015 which looked at how local authorities in England and Wales were supporting um, migrant families within RPF and this time we've kind of widened the scope to cover all four UK nations and also to include vulnerable adults as well to make sure we're kind of reflecting the impact on adult social care um, and essentially what we did was um, we've kind of drew on uh, FOIs to all local authorities around the UK. We did deep dives in seven case study areas uh, to see what kind of local authority uh, policy and practice looked like on a day to day basis. And we also interviewed uh, people with lived experience as well. So in terms of the numbers, I'm going to kind of whiz through this because there's loads to get through in kind of 10 minutes. But essentially, our data showed um, that uh, there's almost kind of local authorities reported around almost 10,000 people are being supported in 21, 22, um, and that includes 3,000 families and almost 6,000 children, but also the kind of first estimate here of the number of vulnerable adults, which is around 1,658 vulnerable adults. Now, this is data that is kind of reported from 142 local authorities. Um, it represents a significant underreporting of need because local authorities have a lot of challenges kind of collating this data in the first place. And so kind of bearing in mind the kind of gaps in data, we worked on a kind of wider estimate, which you can see in the column on the right, which essentially shows if all local authorities recorded this data and had it kind of accurately, what would this picture look like? And so therefore it looks like it's probably more like 18,000 people being supported by local authorities across the UK. Um, and kind of uh, one of the key things to kind of uh, emphasize in this is the cost as well, that's around 102 million pounds um, spent in, in that year by local authorities in supporting cases. Um, we used the kind of estimates to kind of um, look at how trends have changed in recent years. So the 2015 report relied on data from 2012 to 2013, and that shows quite a significant increase in the number of families who are receiving support and numbers of children, but also this kind of whopping rise in annual expenditure for local authorities as well, which very much reflects what local authorities have kind of told us about in terms of kind of the soaring costs that they are encountering for these cases. Um, in terms of the profile of people impacted, I'm going to really whiz through this. It's all in our report. But as I said, essentially around 18,000 people are supported by local authorities. It's a really broad cohort of people, including people who've got status, who've got leave to remain, people with pre-settled status, but also people with an irregular status as well, which includes kind of visa overstayers. And whilst a lot of the research previously around NRPF often focuses on children, our research shows that it impacts people at very kind of different life stages. We heard kind of cases of pregnant mothers, people with children, uh, student visa holders, uh, people in middle age, but also some kind of really quite devastating cases of people kind of near the end of their lives um, and, and kind of requiring kind of um, palliative care with kind of terminal illness. Whilst the kind of home office communication around NRPF often focuses on it being a kind of uh, temporary residence, actually, our research shows that many are kind of long term residents. It includes British born children and adults who've lived in the UK for decades. Most people have been self-sufficient but become destitute following a crisis. Um, there are over 130 different nationalities receiving local authority support, but there's been a particularly sharp increase um, in the number of European nationals post Brexit, with some local authorities saying that kind of European nationals make up 60 to 70 percent of their cases. Um, when we look at families, it's predominantly um, 
female headed single parent households, but it's a more kind of balanced gender ratio for vulnerable adults. Um, and over half of the total number of people supported to wear in Greater London. Um, so in terms of kind of local authority policy and practice, how's this kind of changed in recent years? Um, well, there's significant gaps in data recording still. NRPF networks, kind of NRPF Connect database does enable much more data, but not all local authorities use this. And those that do don't necessarily record adult social care cases. Um, other things that we can see is obviously soaring costs for local authorities. And this is not just because of the kind of housing costs, but also because some of these cases are staying much longer with local authority, particularly adult social care cases, which are much harder to resolve and often require kind of complex care packages. Um, also in kind of recent years, the complexity and politicization of NRPF, local authorities really struggled with the kind of new categories of, of uh, migrant groups, for example, particularly the European nationals who are now impacted by NRPF and what this actually looked like in practice, what were people's rights, um, and also a kind of real fear that local authorities felt they had to do the right thing and they weren't seen to kind of be administering something that was akin to benefits in case it was kind of problematic for them. So a really kind of complex picture for a lot of local authorities to understand. And then real, a real leadership vacuum around this. Essentially what we heard in practice that this is something that's being administered by kind of middle management, frontline practitioners, but a real gap in senior leadership around this in local authorities. Um, and as a result, it means there's quite inconsistent and disjointed practice around local authorities. A lot of cases going back and forth between different different teams, it's kind of unclear who's leading on it, a lack of standardised assessment, um, and also a huge amount of kind of gatekeeping leading to kind of vulnerable people being locked out of support. Um, as I mentioned, kind of issues with case resolution, our, our research showed that actually some cases are actually spending a lot longer with local authorities than they were back in 2015. And this often isn't as a kind of because what local authorities are doing is often linked to kind of delays in home office decision making, gaps in kind of legal advice locally. Um, so real challenges for some of these cases are staying much longer. We've seen a kind of a real rise in the number of specialist teams in local authorities. However, most of the time, a lot of these teams focus just on kind of family cases. There's no crossover with kind of adult social care and, and focusing on those cases as well. So kind of um, an area definitely to be developed um, and something we heard kind of time again and, and saw a lot in practice is this significant variation in subsistent rates and often no kind of set minimum standards in a lot of local authorities despite um, recent guidance and case law that's come out. So in terms of what it's like for people experience of seeking local authority support, um, the kind of main key theme here is the real fear that people have about seeking support. People are kind of often terrified about the kind of ramifications of coming forward, whether that means that they could potentially be reported to the Home Office, it impacts their kind of future applications for leave to remain, or the kind of threat of their children being taken into care. So as a kind of result, the, the numbers of people kind of coming forward are actually a lot lower than the number of people who need support, but people are too fearful. Um, and there are multiple barriers people talked about, you know, needing an advocate just to even get assessed, um, the conflicting advice they would get from local authorities, depending on who they were speaking to, um, the intrusive questions, particularly for parents who felt really judged. So he's going and to get so his phone. As a result, people mm. would often kind Hope of turn to community there. faith groups instead. Uh, people talking about not feeling believed, listened to or respected. And also the kind of lack of accessibility. Often um, a lot of these kind of assessments happening uh, over the phone or online and not being able to kind of speak to people in person. Um, in terms of people's experience of receiving local authority support, um, obviously people kind of talked about it being offering them a total lifeline and, and, and supporting them in the kind of dire moments of need. However, there were a lot of issues that were raised in how this kind of support is administered and, and often kind of real long delays in receiving it in terms of, of people kind of having to depend on charities and food banks until the support actually kicked in. Um, a lot of people talking about getting vouchers instead of cash and not being able to use it in, in kind of places that were close to them or practical to get to or met their kind of dietary and cultural needs. Um, often the amounts they were receiving didn't actually meet their needs. We heard examples of people having to kind of choose to use their subsistence payments to focus on energy instead of food. Um, real inconsistency in rates depending on local authority, but also even within the same local authority at times. 
and a kind of um, quite intrusive monitoring of spending of how people kind of having to show statements um, to to kind of social workers to prove how they were spending that money um, and kind of quite an infantilizing way of, of how they were kind of talked to around this. Um, in terms of housing, we've seen some local authorities move towards um, in recent years trying to secure more permanent housing, but well, more more settled housing and independent housing. Um, but in recent years, it seems like a lot of local authorities, due to kind of the housing crisis, have now resorted back to using hotels and B&Bs. And we heard from people who've been placed there uh, for months on end with no cooking facilities and young children and unable to kind of meet um, those their needs. Um, a lot of issues with the kind of poor quality housing that people are being mo moved into. We heard cases of children being hospitalised because of kind of the conditions of mould, um, within the property and kind of dilapidation and also kind of frequent moves um, with no explanation um, which I know is kind of a key issue with a lot of local authority housing regardless of immigration status but people also talked about the kind of dense social work jargon used in letters and communication real kind of struggles to understand what the local authority was actually telling them um, issues also with it being kind of time limited support that cuts off once a child turns 18 however sometimes their children may not actually have leave to remain or the right to work so they may not actually be able to kind of help support themselves um, and in the case of vulnerable adults often vulnerable adults with multiple health conditions but once one kind of condition has been resolved um, still having the kind of support terminated and people being really fearful of kind of raising issues in case it jeopardizes their support provided or impacts on their immigration case. So often kind of not vocalizing any kind of complaints because they're so fearful that it could lead to support being terminated. Um, and finally, whilst this kind of system is often talked about as almost like a parallel welfare system, there's a lot of kind of limitations to it in the sense there's no kind of clear right of appeal. There's no way of kind of challenging the level of support so, or the kind of decision to terminate support without kind of going through a kind of legal route. So real kind of challenges with that. Um, and so finally, we looked at kind of implications and what would kind of help in terms of kind of policy and practice. Um, obviously, we, we didn't kind of the, the report focuses very much on what local authorities um, can do. However, there was a very kind of clear recommendation and call from the people we spoke to about ending the NRPF condition and at least kind of reviewing it, particularly how it impacts vulnerable cohorts. But we identified five key kind of implications that local authorities can, could kind of look at addressing. Um, firstly, in the, in the improving kind of the governance structure for tackling destitution um, and for local authorities to kind of recognize the significant impact that if you don't address migrant destitution, it really impacts your ability to address wider strategic priorities such as ending child poverty in your local area, um, ending rough sleeping, tackling homelessness, addressing public health inequalities, um, domestic abuse. Um, you cannot do these things without tackling migrant destitution. Um, and, and part of that is really important that there is like a national cross-government UK-wide strategy to look at this, that there is kind of statutory guidance provided to local authorities, and also for local authorities to look at trying to improve data collection around this in terms of the numbers and the costs. Um, secondly, it's really important that there's kind of clear and transparent information advice so people actually know their rights. Um, and that includes local authorities funding more kind of legal advice, particularly in areas where there are is a real kind of shortfall, but also making sure that there's information that's widely disseminated on council websites. There's a real kind of gap. We looked into a lot of the local authorities we were kind of interviewing and we couldn't find anything on their on their information pages about how to seek support and particularly around kind of early preventative help. Um, and that's kind of um, having a, a minimum, a kind of web page that it, talks about how to access advice and support, but also how to apply for kind of change of conditions, where to kind of access information on fee waivers for immigration applications, um, and looking at kind of information to kind of prevent people falling into destitution in the first place. Um, thirdly, looking at how national government can empower local government to, at a minimum, meet its actual legal responsibilities, because that doesn't happen in a lot of areas at the moment, but ultimately kind of moving towards developing much more preventative approaches. So in the first instance, that really requires um, central government to actually adequ adequately resource local authorities to do this. But it also means local authorities need to kind of take responsibility for embedding like the fantastic guidance that's been developed by the NRPF network around 
this, but also making sure that they've actually got clear localized subsistence policies with kind of clear minimum rates, which doesn't happen in a lot of areas at the moment. And that kind of takes into account people's individual needs and kind of draws on the kind of case law and kind of a guidance around this. Um, finally, this is more one for kind of central government, but making sure that um, there is kind of access to, to public funds for the kind of most vulnerable. And that includes the kind of discretionary welfare funds and benefits, um, especially intended to support children, and vulnerable adults, so that children are not being punished because of their parents' immigration status. And lastly, but by no means kind of least, is it's incredibly important. And this is kind of vital to really listen and learn from the voices of people with lived experience of NRPF. Um, and embedding cultures that actually treat people with respect, with dignity, and that involve people with lived experience in designing kind of local policy and practice around NRPF. So that services and policy are kind of informed by people's experiences. Um, so that is it in a nutshell. It's a huge amount of information. Um, so thanks for bearing with me and I'm around for kind of questions later and do get in touch. We really want to kind of make sure this is embedded in practice as much as possible in local authorities. So really kind of welcome um, any kind of request for speaking at, at further meetings. Thanks. Thanks so much, Lucy. That was super comprehensive. You covered an amazing amount in a very short space of time. So thank you very much. Um, it segues really nicely into our next speaker. We're going to hear from um, Maggie, who leads on the local authority work for the City of Sanctuary, um, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the draft No Recourse to Public Funds review document that, um, that we've been working on as a network. Hello, everybody. Oh, it's really strange. I can see myself and it's quite a big picture. So many of you know me. I'm Maggie and I support City of Sanctuary's work with local authorities. We are an incredibly vibrant network of councils all around the UK, really committed to going over and above for all people seeking sanctuary. Um, and uh, those of you who are either exploring or going through the process at the moment will know that we have a condition or requirement uh, around uh, securing Council of Sanctuary status, which says uh, that you as a council will develop a coherent and transparent approach to supporting people with NRPF. Um, I agree with so much uh, of what Lucy said, and um, I think it's really important that, that we uh, actively and proactively, I should say, try and uh, ensure that there is a, a coherent local um, approach. Now, my experience evaluating um, uh, councils recently has been that it is indeed quite patchy and that information in terms of rights and entitlements uh, on council websites is, is quite rare. Um, and uh, as part of having this condition around having a transparent approach, councils have come to me and said, well, Maggie, what does good look like? You know, what would uh, enable us to actually meet this uh, requirement? And so uh, we gathered uh, a, a group, a working group, which included both councils and expert third sector organizations, small and big, to put together what uh, essentially is a um, document that you can put in front of your, yourselves if you are leading on an RPF support um, uh, within your councils or indeed share with, with colleagues. Um, it is a draft, uh, so there is a little bit of a um, a call to action, uh, as, as you, some of you may have seen that we shared the draft document in a Google Doc. Um, so really, we want you to share your good practice examples. Uh, we have already added some that we were aware of. Um, but effectively, um, this is uh, has to be the network's um, document. We, we want everybody to, to have kind of buy in and ownership of it. I will very quickly uh, share it uh, so that you can see it and then I will point out where, um, where we require uh, some input. But essentially it is very much in line. Uh, it, it wasn't seeking to replicate the good work of Compass or the Bevan Foundation in, in Wales or the NRPF network, but it really tried to put uh, a kind of a handy and short and concise document from which you can uh, uh, work off when you're reviewing, updating or tweaking your existing practices. So I will quickly share, hopefully um, this will be smooth. Um, right, so this is what the document looked like, uh, looks like, hopefully you have access to it. We focused on uh, 
high-ish level principles um, so that uh, it can be widely applicable um, and also allow for um, local um, stakeholders, local uh, authorities and their stakeholders to, to kind of determine uh, what exactly uh, a coherent and compassionate approach looks like. So um, at the very start, we have put some key commitments and you will see that they very much echo what Lucy has just said. Um, after that, we talk a little bit about how to embed it, um, and again, uh, very much in line with uh, uh, Compass research and recommendations, it is very important to embed it in, into wider policies, because unless we take this very vulnerable group of people along on the journey, we haven't got a chance in hell to actually meet wider corporate objectives. And so then we... Um, go to to the principles we try to focus them um on the kind of journey or the experiences of of, of people trying to access support um and you won't be surprised again uh, to see awareness of services there is very little on council websites around rights entitlements how data will be shared what people can expect etc uh when they uh, reach out for support the second principle is around referral routes uh, and making sure that people are able to get, uh, not to be bounced around the system uh, looking for support, but rather that there is a very clear way they can access it. Again, we uh, have uh, a couple of sections. One of them is what could this look like and some good practice examples. Again, in the good practice examples, if you have any, please do add them. Maggie. Sorry to interrupt. Um, someone's asking, any chance of making the doc that you're sharing larger? Can you zoom in mm. on your screen? Sure. Sure. I mean, this is right. really just to, to, to walk you through it, uh, and you can have a look and input in your own time. Perfect. Thanks. Right. Now I can't see it, but I will... okay, this is, this is good. Um, so the third principle is around expertise. Uh, it is really important uh, that um, council officers responsible um, are, keep up to speed with what is a very dynamic policy uh, environment. Um, this, this can take a uh, different shape. Oh, little spelling mistake there, I will correct it. It is very much a draft. Um, and uh, also ensuring that councillors but also the wider um, um, uh, staff members also have a basic awareness around um, NRPF. Uh, assessing need uh, is the fourth principle. Um, again, this is about um, recognizing the impact. I think Lucy just mentioned how people feel um, that uh, the, the, the assessment process could be quite undignified. So it's really important that when doing assessments, uh, those are centered around humanity. Um, equity and support, there is quite a, a bit about there, but uh, around housing, obviously there is a particular challenge in two tier areas where uh, districts are or cities are responsible for housing and uh, counties are responsible for social care. So, so having a, a kind of a seamless uh, support offer between the, uh, the two tiers is, is quite crucial. Again, subsistence uh, is mentioned here, accommodation. Uh, we have made a little bit of space for what councils can do for people that don't have care or support needs and how to uh, ensure that there is a safety net for them as well. Um, there is a, a little bit around broader benefits and, of course, immigration advice. Um, there is quite a lot of evidence that immigration advice can support people uh, to move on to mainstream benefits. Of course, this is uh, very much an investor save and councils are increasingly stepping into this. Um, I won't go through all of the case resolution uh, is another principle. And of course, we have data collection, which is still incredibly, uh, incredibly poor and hard to get hold of. Um, and two, um, two more principles. Uh, there is, uh, of course, around including the voices of residents with NRPF in shaping support. 
and of course advocating for lasting change. I think most people on this call will agree that this is an incredibly cruel condition, but also a, a very costly one for local authorities. So um, previous principles very much focus around, well, what can we do within uh, the system that we have? And, and this final one is advocating for its removal. Uh, I will stop uh, the share there, but again, really, this is a draft document. We want it to be your document, um, and I hope that you will have a look and input. Uh, you can add a comment or you can uh, add also directly to, to the document in track changes, and we'll try and include all of your comments. I need to credit Chris from Project 17 because she actually put a lot of work um, into this document, and Tom from NACOM um, and various other people. And Bettina, I think she's on the call as well. Hopefully, I haven't, uh, um, uh, you know, missed uh, too many people. But thank you so much um, for for putting it together, and let's uh, work on it, and then empower uh, council colleagues to be able to benchmark their existing policies. Thank you so much, Maggie. A couple of things. Um, one is, um, can you make sure that the link's sent round? Because a couple of people are saying that they've missed the link. So we'll make sure that that's circulated. But also, do you have any timescales in terms of comments and people um, people feeding back on the draft? I would say a couple of weeks is, is probably um, in, enough. Um, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, let's say a couple of weeks. I haven't even thought about that. What I'll do is um, after the session, I will uh, share it again and um, and then we can, um, yeah, we can have a think and I'll send some instructions and I'll pu put it in the chat now uh, for those who um, perhaps are not on the mailing list. Fab. And yes, we do have some time for some questions on the document and for other speakers at the end of the session. So we'll come on to that. Thanks very much, Maggie. That was brilliant. And I know um... you've muted yourself, Rosie. Oh, I was just saying thank you, Maggie. Um, and thanks to all of the work that's gone into it, because I know lots of people have, um, have put lots of work into it as well. OK, I'm going to pass on now to Cynthia and Helen from Central England Law Centre, who are going to talk a little bit about the Birmingham case and implications for local authorities. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yep. Great. Um, so I'm Cynthia Orchard. I work as a consultant policy advisor with Kids in Need of Defence UK, which is hosted at Central England Law Centre. And I'm here with uh, my colleague Helen, who is the communications and engagement manager at the Law Centre. And she'll speak uh, briefly just after I do. Um, so I wanted to first say thanks to Maggie for organizing this meeting and inviting us and also for the, the draft that you just shared, Maggie. It looks really, really fantastic and really, really important document. Um, and also thanks to Lucy. I think the research that Compass has done is really fantastic and it, it completely affirms a lot of what everyone who works in this sector will have been hearing um, and seeing for years and years and years. Um, but it's really great to have it as a, a piece of research uh, that we can all refer to. Um, I wanted to also to say um, that I, and I think everyone who's speaking today, we really understand the, the very difficult circumstances that exist in most or possibly all local authorities these days. It's, uh, I think everyone who works in the charity sector gets it, that local authorities are, are really struggling and uh, you have our, our sympathy. We also really applaud all the work that local authorities are doing, um, especially those which are city, part of the Cities of Sanctuary Network to make this country a more welcoming place for refugees and migrants. It's such, such important work. And it's really great to see so many people from local authorities around the UK attending this meeting today. It's really heartening to see that. Um, I'm going to discuss briefly a 2023 High Court case called BCD, um, which was brought by the Law Centre, um, and it relates to the appropriate levels of support um, for under Section 17 for children in need. Um, and I hope that you'll take my comments as they're intended to simply help local authorities to ensure that they meet the, le the legal requirements that exist to adequately support children in need and to avoid litigation like this case, which will continue to arise if local authorities don't fulfill children's rights. 
And we all know that litigation is adversarial, it's costly, it's time consuming, and it is best to avoid it if at all possible by taking actions like this draft document that Maggie just shared um, and implementing that so that the policies and practices are there in place to provide sufficient support to children in need. Um, I personally don't get involved in litigation these days. I, I am, uh, I have uh, trained as a lawyer, but I don't work as a, as a litigator. Um, and uh, we, we do have experts at the, at the law center who, who work in the public law team, who brought, who bring legal challenges like this one, um, where children in need are not being adequately supported. Um, the case of BCD concerned a child who was, uh, when he was five years old, his mother uh, sadly died after an illness. And a few weeks before his mum died, his grandmother, who is a Jamaican citizen, came to the UK from Jamaica to visit her daughter, the child's mum, and the family. And <laughs> the grandmother was always lawfully present in the UK, but she was subject to an NRPF condition and she wasn't allowed to work. Um, after her, his mum died, BCD was a child in need under Section 17 of the Children Act, um, but the local authority um, initially didn't provide adequate support to BCD and his family. So the High Court judgment of last year describes some families as capped and others, and by far the majority of NRPF families as uncapped. And I'm gonna explain what this means. It's a it's a quite a long and complex judgment. Um, and I'll just say as well, we're gonna we haven't done slides, but we we're gonna be sharing lots of resources. So don't worry, don't try and memorize everything I'm gonna say. If it's a little bit confusing, it's because the judgment is quite complex. Um, but it, essentially the judgment says that uncapped families are eligible for a welfare standard of support, um, whereas capped families may not be. But it's really, really important to note that the cap doesn't apply to everyone who has a, an NRPF condition. It applies only in quite limited circumstances. And that those circumstances need to be evaluated properly um, and if necessary, but only if necessary, um, through a human rights assessment. The, the judgment also talks about, uh, in terms of the cap, what, what they call an ECHR breach cap, which is a, a reference to the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, the breach cap applies only if um, a non-British citizen parent or carer of a child in need falls into one of a few ineligible classes which are set out in law. And in those cases, then support that benefits the ineligible adult as well as the child is capped at a level that is set solely to avoid an ECHR breach, um, for example, so that the family won't be subject to inhuman or degrading circumstances or experience a violation of their right to family or private life. The ineligible groups of people are, are quite limited. They're set out in the Nationality, Immigration and Asylum Act of 2002. Um, and it refers to three groups. First, um, people who have refugee status okay. in another country. Second, uh, people who are failed asylum seekers who uh, have been through the entire asylum system and have been finally refused um, and who have failed to cooperate with removal directions or taken reasonable steps to leave the UK when they were required to do that. Or third, people who are in the UK who are in breach of immigration laws and who are not seeking asylum. And those are the three categories of, of people who can be capped. Um, under this judgment. So as a result uh, of the judgment where a child in need is cared for by a foreign national adult who has NRPF, who does not fall into one, one of those capped categories, um, local authorities are required to provide support under section 17 at a welfare standard. And the rates of support must adequately promote the child's welfare. And in BCD's case, the judge found that the, 
the rate of support required was the same as a fostering allowance of 510 pounds per week, which was significantly higher than the subsistence rate that many local authorities pay um, for Section 17 support. Um, the judge also said that the welfare standard will almost certainly not be met through asylum support levels because the asylum support rates don't make any allowance for things like books, toys, or recreational activities, which are all included in a welfare standard of support. Um, the judge also said that if the welfare standard doesn't apply, if the family is capped, then Section 17 support if it's uh, if the family is eligible for Section 17 support, it must be provided at least at the very minimum at this, the asylum support level plus utilities. Um, but that is just a minimum floor and it may well not be sufficient to meet the family's needs. So the judge very, very clearly sets out that local authorities cannot simply tie Section 17 support levels to asylum support levels. Um, and that they need to have a policy in place and a practice in place to do an appropriate assessment of the family's circumstances and needs. Um, and they need to also take into account relevant case law and increases in the cost of living to make sure that the rates that they're paying are going up in accordance with um, the lived experience of the people who need the support. Um, and another key thing, finding about the judgment is that even if the family is capped and limited to a subsistence level of support, the local authority can still provide some support in kind directly to a child in need. So, for example, child counseling or therapeutic activities, those can still be provided. Um, and then finally, I'll end just by saying that in my opinion, and in many other people's opinions, all children should be supported to the welfare standard of support because all children need things like toys and books and recreational activities. Um, and I think that it would be very wise as a local authority to take that into account when designing these policies. Um, so we will share some resources. One of them is a briefing that uh, Kind UK put together with the Law Centre last year, which explains the judgment in a bit more detail and has some other links to resources. And Helen's also uh, been working really hard to put together some other resources. Um, but I'll hand over um, now to Helen to just share a couple other things about the case and, and um, the way the Law Centre is, is working to try to get the case implemented. Helen? Hi everybody, um, I've got my camera off, um, unfortunately my connection's a bit unstable so when I've had it on I've not really been able to hear. Um, right, so as Cynthia said I've been working on some resources to help people better understand the judgement. Um, because this is still a relatively new ruling, it's not yet fully understood and we, we don't think it's being properly applied. Um, the judgment should result in changes to the NRPF policies and practices in many local authorities across the country, um, all of which should improve the situation for many families who have children in need and ensuring their rights and their needs are being met. Um, to ensure that the families receive their entitlement, it must be applied widely and properly understood, but it is quite a complicated ruling, as Cynthia has said. Um, my role at the Law Centre is communications and engagement, so I'm not actually on the front line dealing with families in need like many of you um, and like the majority of my colleagues at the Law Centre and our par partner organisations. Um, so I can only imagine there will be countless scenarios um, that you will come across in which you'll need to understand how the ruling applies to the families you're supporting. Um, but local authorities need to ensure that their NRPF teams and the legal teams are aware of the case. Um, and that they understand and are implementing the law properly. Um, so they need to understand, as Cynthia said, which families are capped um, and which are not, and to provide appropriate levels of support. Um, we recently held a meeting with a network of organisations, mostly in the not-for-profit and voluntary sector, who are supporting NRPF families to discuss what everybody's seeing, how the ruling's being applied, um, and during that meeting, there was a discussion about how we can work together across the board to ensure the ruling is properly understood and applied as it becomes more normalised. 
Um, there'll be a follow-up meeting to discuss next steps to that meeting, which you're all more than welcome to come along to. So it would be great to see as many local authorities represented at that meeting as possible. Um, I'll put a link in the chat to um, a sign-up form and I'll put my email address in there as well so you can contact me if you are interested. Um, and I'll also include the link to some of the resources and the FAQs that we have on our website, which explain the ruling and how it applies. Um, lastly, and Lucy alluded to the complexity of the picture regarding NRPF, uh, we just want to acknowledge that this is just one of several cases that chip away at the complex statutory machinery that excludes many migrants from benefits and community care services. So the Law Centre um, and many others have brought many cases that challenge this framework and will continue to do so with the aim of ensuring that all children receive appropriate amounts of support. Um, so our final message really, and again, this is echoes one of the many great insights that Lucy made about the importance of legal advice, is that affected families and local authorities benefit when local authorities actively refer families subject to NRPF conditions to get competent legal advice to see if they're eligible for a change of conditions application or an immigration or citizenship application that would allow removal of the NRPF condition and access to public funds. Um, so that's our, our one key takeaway. Um, I'll, I'll add a link into the sign up form and the resources that I've mentioned into the group now. OK. Thank you very much, Helen and Cynthia. Um, that was super, really informative and brilliant to have the briefings and the resources and also the offer of the follow up meeting as well. So thank you both very much for for sharing that. OK, now we're going to hear from Bettina, who is from the South London Refugee Association um, to talk a little bit about taking care report recommendations. Thanks, Bettina. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, coming. It's so good to see so many local authorities here. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. I've got some slides. If you give me one second. There you go. Can everyone see them okay? Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm Bettina. I am Policy and Participation Manager at South London Refugee Association. Um, SLRA, I'll call it SLRA from now on because it's a bit of a mouthful, um, is a smallish organisation in South London, in Streatham. We offer casework support to um, children and young people and adults and families. We are also growing our community organizing element of our work and run a community hub men's group and youth club each week. Um, I'm here today to talk about how local authorities can best address immigration issues of children in care. And just to contextualize the work in the NRPF conversation, I, I hope it's very clear that um, resolving issues of children in care before they turn 18 um, gives children with immigration issues um, as good a chance as a British child in care to lead independent lives, um, to access benefits and to and can save a local authority a lot of money. Um, so the um, oh, sorry, my slides aren't working. My internet's a bit bad. So. Um, SLRA five years ago partnered with Merton Local Authority on an early intervention project. Um, what this aimed to do is to create clearer and more effective referral pathways between Merton and SLRA um, to create open and honest conversations about the barriers that are stopping um, best practice and to develop resources with social workers and caseworkers at SLRA um, to build understanding and confidence to support children and young people in care with immigration issues. So throughout this five year, five years ago it started and throughout this process, um, we have seen that early intervention really works. Um, more children have been supported to access early immigration advice and good quality legal representation, improving outcomes for children. It provided the opportunity to develop advice and training to social workers, which allows them to understand what, which, which questions to ask and what information and evidence to gather to identify immigration issues and support with applications. 
and it embeds progress towards regularization into planning and practice. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Um, what it also does is it allows social workers to identify and challenge poor quality legal advice and representation. Um, we saw throughout this project that more young people were getting secure immigration status before they turn 18, which avoids many challenges and costs, which I'll also talk about later, faced by local authorities when a child turns 18 with insecure or irregular immigration status. Um, and as Cynthia mentioned previously, we can't ignore the many barriers that exist at the moment to um, children and young people regularizing status. Uh, there is a lack of availability of good quality legal advice and representation available with the legal aid crisis. Um, which leads to poor quality legal representation, and we see time and time again, time and time again, that poor quality advice has really serious um, effects on um, children's outcomes. Um, there is also a lack of understanding or confidence in gathering um, information and evidence to support with applications and how to be proactive throughout that process. And there is a complicated and ever-changing immigration system, so it's hard to know best routes to support young people to regularise status. And obviously there are the systemic home office delays, which at the moment, uh, well, let's just say they could get much worse. Um, so the early intervention project, um, ha having identified all the benefits of early intervention, and all the barriers that local authorities face. A report called the Taking Care Report, which is available on our website, I'll post the link after this in the chat, um, identified four recommendations, which we're calling the uh, Immigration Support Pledge. The first recommendation of these uh, of the pledge is to identify all looks after children and care leavers with immigration and nationality issues. If we don't find them, we can't help them. Um, this is all about identifying issues early and how to do this. Um, it's all about gathering evidence and it's about building a system for the future to standardise practice really so that it is easier to identify issues as early as possible. So this is the first recommendation of four um, that make up the pledge. And when a local authority commits to these, um, SLRA will provide support to understand how best to go about embedding this practice uh, where you work. The second recommendation is to connect looked after children and care leavers with good quality legal support as soon as possible, because we see that early advice really is life changing. It's about identifying experts. Uh, in your area. So in the case of Merton, SLRA was a partner organization that um, was in the local area. Um, it's, although there is a legal aid crisis, legal aid still is available. We're hearing from social workers that they're sort of finding it, feeling a bit desperate about finding good quality legal advice. It is there and it might be that a child or young person has to wait a while, but it really is worth trying to find good quality legal support still and get advice as soon as you can. So although this is difficult, I cannot stress enough that there are still legal aid solicitors of good quality um, available and willing to support children and young people with their immigration status. The third recommendation is take a proactive and informed um, approach in supporting looked after children, oops, sorry, and care leavers through any immigration applications and appeals. Um, we will be by their side through the legal process. This is all about care and pathway planning. So really embedding this into um, care and pathway planning. It's about training. We see that when social workers are trained to understand a very complex, the very complex system that's ever changing, they feel more confident to provide support and be proactive in um, identifying any issues and challenging um, poor representation. Um, and it's about really being by a child's side from beginning to end. Um, the fourth recommendation is enable those who are eligible to apply for permanent status and British citizenship. Um, the idea here is that temporary status is not enough. It doesn't provide enough security. 
Um, citizenship has many benefits and um, it allows a child who feels British to have identity and belonging. Um, so why would a local authority adopt the pledge? We know it works. We see with Merton the outcomes and we've since worked with four other local authorities and we're starting to see the benefits of that. Um, it can save a local authority lots of money. Um, there's a slide a little later on that shows just how much. Um, and training, it provides training that helps social care professionals to understand immigration issues and equips them to carry out their duties under the Children Act 1989. It creates clearer and tighter referral pathways with a partner organization, membership to the network of social care experts, updates directly from home office on policy changes. Um, there's a special interest group that you would all be invited to be a part of. And immigration is not a niche issue. One in 10 children in care have an immigration issue, which was a finding from the Taken Care Report. This is the amount of money that still amazes me. Um, £138,686 is the potential cost to children's services for each undocumented child in care who leaves care without immigration status. And this is an underestimate. And um, this is also from the Taking Care Report, which I'll post in the, um, in the chat a bit later. So the cost, the small cost of an application for British citizenship is nothing when you compare it to that amount. So what does adopting the pledge look like? Um, SLRA will hold a meeting with relevant heads of services to discuss what changes need to be made to your case management system to better record and mon monitor nationality and immigration status, um, including any changes to internal templates, for example, single assessment, care plan, pathway plans to better record any mon and monitor nationality and immigration status. It creates clearer and tighter, refer tighter referral pathways and access to quality immigration advice. Uh, we also offer guidance and support on how to use SLRA as policy resources for local authorities. And you will also have access to training delivered by SLRA to deepen understanding of the policy resources available on our website. Sorry, apologies, it says Croydon there because I recently gave this presentation to Croydon who are thinking of adopting it. You'll also be invited to join a special interest group made up of other LA colleagues and NGOs to discuss issues facing local authorities across the country and develop peer support networks. These are a copy of the two resources that were um, created, social workers from Merton and caseworkers from SLRA, along with some young people who um, were receiving casework support from SLRA at the time, Merton um, young people uh, fed into creating these resources and the training is all around sort of deep diving into these and understanding um, them better. Um, these are the five local authorities that have adopted the pledge so far, Merton, Lambeth, City of London, Shropshire and Southwark. I think a couple of you are on the call and we are on our way to supporting a few more um, local authorities to adopt it at the moment. Um, so that's it, sort of whistle stop, very quick tour of um, the pledge. If you've got any questions, please feel free to contact me. My email address is there. Um, what I didn't make clear throughout this is that this is not just for um, asylum seeking children, this is for any child in care with any immigration issue. Um, and yeah, thank you. That's me. I hope I didn't go over too much. No, you didn't at all. Thank you very much, Bettina. Just a quick one um, from the chat. Do you work across um, the country or is it just within? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Also should make that clear. So SLR, we currently work across the country. Um, GMIAU in um, Manchester are doing some very similar work and we're currently figuring out what that looks like. Um, we are very happy to speak to anybody across the country. Um, what we like to do is partner a local authority up with a local organization where that's not possible because we are aware it's not always possible. SLRA can offer the sort of preliminary support and then you will be invited to join the special interest group and hopefully through that remain engaged in conversations that will support and continue uh, to your continuation of embedding and um, better practice. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That was um that was super and yeah um 
please do share the documents and the and the links in the chat that'd be brilliant mm -hmm. thanks again okay um finally um we're going to hear from Lou from Asylum Matters, who is going to talk us through um, the Illegal Migration Act and a briefing for local authorities. Thanks. Bettina, you need to unshare, I think. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I am Lou, Louise Calvi. I'm the Director of Asylum Matters. Um, we um, campaign on asylum rights in the United Kingdom. And uh, with our wonderful friends in NACOM, we developed a briefing specifically on the Illegal Migration Act, uh, written for local authorities, just some of the key considerations from your perspective, and some of the things that you might want to explore in terms of mitigating some of the impact of the Illegal Migration Act. Uh, before I share my screen, got a very short presentation. I'm just dropping in the chat a link to the report uh, in case you haven't seen it already. Uh, so it's there on, on our website. And again, huge thanks to our friends at NACOM uh, who co-authored this with us. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen by the power of witchcraft. And hopefully you can all see that. Um, so... Um, the theme of the day seems to be our uh, destitution and, and an RPF. And that really is one of the key considerations around the implications of the Illegal Migration Act. Now, obviously, we're in a situation where uh, we're in the pre-election period. The Illegal Migration Act was one of the key pillars uh, of the Conservative government. Obviously, uh, we don't know uh, what the general election will bring. Um, so far, I think the Liberal Democrat manifesto yesterday committed to repealing the Illegal Migration Act in full. Uh, Labour have proposed similarly that they would need to look at the Illegal Migration Act with a view to uh, repealing it. Uh, I think the Tory um, Conservative election manifesto that's being talked about right now is very much looking at um, full implementation of the Illegal Migration Act. So depending on the outcome of the election, this, this, this may or may not be an issue that we're all going to have to grapple with. The bottom line is the Illegal Migration Act is on the statute books at the moment. It is already having an impact on people seeking asylum going through the system. And as local authorities, you will start to be seeing that impact in your communities. So the Illegal Migration Act essentially uh, removes the right to claim asylum and settle in the UK for all people that have uh, migrated irregularly to the UK massively doubles down on some of the impact that Lucy was talking about earlier around NRPF by actually creating a, 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 a massive increase to street-based destitution within people that would ordinarily be seeking asylum. So it really drives a new, fresh destitution and homelessness crisis in our community. Uh, it also potentially creates additional safeguarding risks for children seeking sanctuary. Uh, and it removes key protections uh, for survivors of slavery uh, and modern uh, and trafficking. Uh, so essentially the asylum ban, and that's been how the Illegal Migration Act has been described by UNHCR. So it's not our choice of language, that's UNHCR describing it as an asylum ban. It essentially says uh, that you, your claim, your claim for asylum is inadmissible. So it will not be explored by the UK government. Um, that I, I think from April, at around April, when the immigration stats came out, there was around, uh, there was over 50,000 cases that were already inadmissible under the Illegal Migration Act. By now, you're probably looking at around between 60 and 70,000 cases that will be inadmissible under the Illegal Migration Act. So that 60, 70,000 people that are just sitting in that endless limbo, that, that there's no route to status for them. On NRPF, um, one of the key things that you can do to offset NRPF is try and get people status, try and regularise status. What the Illegal Migration Act is removes a core route to people being able to regularise their status. Their claim will never be explored in the UK while the Illegal Migration Act is still in force and on the books. Um, 
So it, it, it's key for you guys as local authorities in terms of understanding um, the level of growth in the destitution population. Um, these are people that will be permanently locked out of work. They will be permanently locked out of benefits. Um, and when you couple that with very, very low levels of financial support through the asylum system, the fact that asylum support has also just been reduced in hotels and in mass containment sites such as barracks and barges, it's been reduced to around £8.50 a week. So essentially people living their whole lives on that very, very small amount of money, constantly threatened with arrest, detention, removal to Rwanda. We saw uh, last month um, that that real comms push on removals to Rwanda and people getting arrested very much the, the 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 channels through our asylum support partners has been that those activities really and and the fact that people can't get status through the asylum system anymore are really driving people to leave asylum support to leave the asylum system that fear is bullying out bullying them out of the system they may very well end up remigrating, but remigration routes from the UK are very challenging and quite dangerous as well. Um, and so it's highly likely that a significant portion of that growing and admissible backlog is going to remain in the UK, street destitute, or in some form of criminal labor or sexual exploitation. So our message around this uh, as a campaigning charity to government has very much been you are creating a destitution and exploitation crisis that is going to play out in every community of the UK and, and for you guys as local authorities. In the briefing and on the presentation, which, which I'm happy to circulate, uh, you'll see some suggestions on some things that you can do um, as local authorities to both uh, stand against this but also some practical things that you can do to try and offset and alleviate some of the impacts of this. Um, again, you know, talking about that perma backlog, that, that, that growing number of people whose claims are gonna be permanently inadmissible. Refugee Council projections are saying that in the first three years of that implementation, could be looking at um, around uh, a, a quarter of a million people that will be locked in that perma backlog of never being able to have status. So essentially they'll be indefinitely in the uh, asylum accommodation, which will be increasingly those mass containment sites, um, HMOs, uh, hotels. Uh, and the, the other key thing here is the Illegal Migration Act withdraws the incentive to present to authorities. If you can't get status ever, if you can't even claim asylum, uh, quite, why would you present to authorities? You might as well, very well, uh, you know, try and survive yourself in the, 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 the grey corners, the dark corners of communities, which again, it sh should worry us all. The other key thing to underline about the IMA uh, is that it makes, um, it, you can't return people to their home country largely without exploring their asylum claim. So essentially what they've done is created through this perma backlog an inability to ever give someone status, but equally an inability to ever return someone to their home country. Essentially what the Tory government did is, is put all of their eggs in, in the basket of Rwanda which obviously is, is going to be subject to further litigation and further constitutional legal challenges, but also the numbers that Rwanda are able to viably receive are very low compared to the size that's already in the perma backlog. I mean, it is a, an unfathomably um, self-defeating piece of legislation. It's one of the most chaotic pieces of legislation national government have ever passed in our view. So, it, Either which way you look at it, you guys as local authorities will have a growing destitution and exploitation problem. Um, as, as I've described on this, this slide, that means that people will be permanently locked out of benefits, permanently locked out of work, permanently locked out of things like the right to rent and things like that, uh, but also it will have an impact on their 
ability to access NHS services, their ability to access some educational provision. Uh, and it will massively compound the increasing mental health crisis within the asylum system. Uh, we've discussed the fact there's going to be a massive increase in homelessness and destitution throughout the UK through the IMA. And in the guide, again, there's some, some tips and, and, and some suggestions of things that you can try to do to offset some of that as local authorities. When it comes to a children's perspective, they are treated the same as adults in terms of inadmissibility of claims. So children irregularly migrating to the UK will not be able to climb a cell, claim asylum under the IMA um, and, and children in, in families with inadmissible claims similarly those claims are inadmissible. Uh, children will usually be supported continue to be supported by local authority until the age of 18 uh, and then they'll be subject to the same conditions. So you will see we already see that as uh, unaccompanied asylum seeking children are approaching the age of 18, there is a, a, a risk of destitution and exploitation around that 18, um, the 18 year old mark. You're likely to see more of that in the IMA or, or children for which have already traveled after the IMA dates. Uh, so to be mindful of that in terms of your children's services and how you can mitigate some of the risk of exploitation and trafficking around the 18th birthday. Um, so again, some suggestions, uh, and um, we've uh, already referenced South London Refugees Association pledge. So great to see uh, the previous speaker uh, speaking through that. Um, and just being mindful, obviously, if um, if the Conservative government win, they've already talked about um, centralising age assessment process, adopting scientific age assessment processes as part of the IMA as well. Um, so looking at developing your own expertise as local authority around your age assessment process, those scientific age assessments process have been highly disputed from a, a, a from a validity perspective from a, other scientists. Um, and really, the, the one thing that we were, we were stressing through this is trying to build the capacity of, of legal representations in your local authority. There is a on top of all of these problems with the IMA, there is a real quite catastrophic collapse in legal advice across the UK. Something like 50% of new asylum applications can't find a legal representation. So really working with your local uh, immigration advice providers, your values-based immigration advice providers and building capacity, particularly around the implications of the IMA. And just a note on survivors of trafficking and slavery, um, similarly, um, they uh, do fall within the auspices of IMA um, and it cuts off their route to status uh, if, again, if they have travelled into the UK irregularly. So really it's, it's, it's pervasive on all um, types of different migrants that would usually claim asylum and other protection methods, um, including... Um, children, families, and uh, survivors of trafficking in slavery. And that's all from me. Thank you very much, Lou. Um, so much there from all of the speakers and from that final speaker as well. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. We've got a little bit of time before we finish up at half one. Lizzie, you've got your hand up. Hi, thanks so much. Thanks, Louise. Um, I'm Lizzie. I'm a public health principal from the London Borough of Newham and I lead on our migrant health work. Um, that was such a helpful presentation. I had a couple of questions. Um, one was with regards to homelessness of families. Um, so obviously at the, at the moment when a family doesn't have recourse to public funds um, under Section 17, they would be accommodated to ensure the safety of that, that family and that child. Will that be the situation in, in this case, for example? Would we see more families perhaps um, needing support from the local authority under Section 17? And then my second question is about NHS support. And um, it said in your, you mentioned your presentation about if they disengage. I just wonder whether you could just clarify what you meant sort of by that, like, you know, for example, will it be sort of just primary care and emergency care that people will be entitled to? So, you know, what does that mean for a pregnant woman? Um, 
yeah, just wonder whether you could say a bit more about about that because I'm keen to sort of you know share share these insights with with other partners. Thanks. You just unmute Lou. Sorry, just trying to find my unmute button. <laughs> Um, okay, Section 17 support and the IMA. It, honestly, the IMA is a mess. It, as I said, it is. It, it's just because I keep reading. You keep reading it. You think you, you can't possibly be saying these things. It's just it, it. It's a mess. Some of the terms of it have already been enacted. Like some of some of the terms have already been implemented. Some haven't. So it's important to note that although the IMA is in the statute book. Not all of the sections of the IMA have been uh, fully implemented yet. When it comes to children's care, our understanding is that the provisions of the Children Act should be assumed to still apply, but the sections in the IMA that the Home Secretary has given themselves the power to um, intervene in a situation of a irregular migrant child's care so a child that falls under the ima uh the the home secretary can intervene um but the substantive position should be that the children act should still apply because obviously that principle that the children act apply to all children regardless of status is a massively important principle I have no doubt that there will be some litigation around that and there will be legal challenge there will be legal challenges on every aspect of the IMA because most of it is um contradictory towards each other and contradicts other substantive pieces of legislation. So I guess what I'm saying is it's pretty much as clear as mud, but you should continue to apply the Children Act in full. I would say that the biggest problem that you're going to have with the AMA as local authorities is children and families being fearful of working with local authorities because they're frightened of the enforce enforcement risks around it. And certainly since the Rwanda arrests, the atmosphere and the mood within asylum seeking communities has changed significantly. People are terrified and people are leaving their hotels they're leaving their asylum accommodation because they're just so fearful of arrest that will be impacting on you and it certainly will be impacting on unaccompanied asylum seeking children I would imagine um, when it comes to the NHS my my colleague wrote the briefing and I think there's a section on the NHS in the physical briefing so have a look at that there's also uh, our email addresses are in that link that I've popped through. If it doesn't answer your question, pop us an email and we'll always help you out around that. Thanks so much, Louise. Thank you. Thanks. Tamara, you've got your hand up. I have some more general questions um, also about the City of Sanctuary NRPF document. And so before I get to that, if anybody has specific questions for Lou, just in like, I guess, coherence of this, would you like to go first? I will. Um, thanks, Tamara. That's so kind of you. Um, so I'm Christiana and I'm um, the Refugee Asylum and Evacuee Manager for Manchester City Council. And I think my question to Lou is, um, yeah, you know, we've have had briefing on, you know, the IM, IMA and, you know, we're so lucky to um, have good, um, you know, partnership with Greater Manchester Immigration Aid Unit uh, in Manchester here. Um, I guess, yeah, you know, given all of this, because we do know that, you know, all the responsibility, um, you know, for people that get caught up, you know, um, you know, as a result of the IMA, um, will fall on local authority. And I was just, I would just like to know from, you know, your perspective and, you know, other organization perspective, what more um, do you think that local authority should be doing? Yeah, you know, we sit down with colleagues from the Home Office, but 
you 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 trying to say to them you know you give them evidence that this is not good this isn't right and stuff like that but it's you might as well be talking to a brick wall but i was just wondering whether is there anything else that from your perspective you think would be you know effective to kind of like whack the home office with because it's just that you know they're not listening sorry <laughs> um <laughs> Str hard, strong relate, strong relate to the Home Office not listening. Uh, to you. Um, th look, th the reality is, um, I I don't think government's listening to Home Office. There is nothing in the Illegal Migration Act, uh, that is yeah. about that is e even vaguely helpful in terms of controlling borders. You know, like I said, it, yeah. it actually removes. Um, yeah. removal rights that the Home Office used to have. It's 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 utterly counterproductive. It's, it's, yeah. it's an insane piece of legislation. So and I think the Home Office privately are mm. are, are, are quietly pulling pulling their hair out over it as well. Yeah. Um, I would say for you as local authorities, uh again in the briefing that I've linked to, you will see that there's some tangible suggestions for you guys within that. I think absolutely keep working with Maggie and the team in City of Sanctuary, become a council of sanctuary because we need you guys in this movement. We really do. We together, NGOs, local authorities, we have to see change in this space um, because the human cost and the financial cost of this legislation is insane. So I think absolutely look at what you can do to drive a position of change. But I think that more tangibly investing legal representation, because there may be other um, migration routes that uh, people can can uh, apply. There, they, they, they may be legal challenges that they can bring as well to their inadmissibility. Uh, although the IMA does seek to close down all of those legal avenues. Crucially, though, as well, invest in your hosting infrastructure would be my personal advice. There are specialist hosting charities. Like, for example, one of the groups that I'm most worried about is those people that are in trafficking and exploitation. There is now no safety for them in stepping forward and talking about their trafficking and exploitation. Um, and actually what will happen potentially is they come forward and say, I, you know, I was trafficked into the UK and I've been in a situation of slavery. You know, all that waits for them is barracks and a removal to Rwanda. There's no route to status for them. And I think that that is hugely dangerous. However, you've got brilliant hosting providers like Hope at Home that specialize in nationally, they specialize in hosting for survivors of slavery and trafficking. Work with them, increase their capacity in your areas. You've all got hosts that potentially are moving through homes for Ukraine. Yeah. See if you can redirect them to refugees at home from a homelessness perspective and exploitation perspective to hope at home, invest in your local infrastructure up in Greater Manchester. You've got Boas Trust, which are amazing as well. At, yes. At, at home thing. Mm. Find, find what's in your ecosystem. You need immigration advice. You need hosting. You need destitution support. Find those charities and invest in them would be my advice. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Louise. Thank you. Rosie, Thanks. if I could on. just make a quick comment, although I know Tamara's waiting. Tamara, why don't you go? Because I think your question is for me anyway, and then I'll, I'll make a couple of comments. Thank you. I'm going to try and be brief because I know we're running out of time. And just to say it's such a pleasure to be on this call with so many experts, many whom I haven't seen in ages. Like This is just such a privileged conversation. Um, really quickly, my name is Tamara Smith. I sit in the migration team at the Greater London Authority and I lead on Londoners with insecure immigration status and NRPF is one of our priority themes. Um, just to catch you guys up, um, at London level, we're currently exploring alongside colleagues at London councils and um, who I think are on this call and the NRPF network. We're sort of exploring how to improve convening across local authorities, both in terms of good practice uh, development and a combined voice on NRPF and how to improve consistent reporting across services to better document the need um, and the burden on local authorities around NRPF. Um, just coming to the City of Sanctuary document, because I think some of the 
some of the recommendations, um, I mean, this whole document is really wonderful, first of all, but I think specifically I wanted to pick up, um, we really support the commitment around councils having a clear strategy of how to support. I guess my concern is... As, as I'm sure many of you know. Oh, <laughs> sorry, my face just got so much bigger than it was before. I wasn't quite ready for that. Um, as some of as many of you will know our concern around the single point of contact is just the fragmentation of expertise that we see both between local authorities and within local authorities um and i think i mean i see colleagues nodding on the call around this already like we know that in one local authority we'll have someone in children's services who's amazing on nrpf in another local authority it's someone in the vorg team in another space it's somebody in adult social care um and so those people are all incredible but they're isolated and it's really difficult to then find a single person within a local authority who's going to think about nrpf at all of its relevant intersections. Um, so really eager to have sort of further conversations around that with anybody who's interested because it's like the headache, honestly. Um, and then I think just coming back to this, um, this improved relationship between local authorities and civil society and, and sort of building on what Lou was saying, just if we're just honest with ourselves that all migrants are going to be more scared of local authorities in the current climate um and so this relationship between civil society and local authorities is so particularly important but also the nrpf space is the space with the most conflict around this <laughs> between civil society and local authorities because lots of civil society organizations are taking local authorities to court on nrpf so uh just you know and and there's there's reasons for all of those things but i guess just to say it, I would we would really welcome sort of further developed language around that and some good practice examples of those functioning relationships just to kind of demonstrate that need. Um, and I'd be really curious to hear from local authorities on the call around like any examples of good practice around this, because we know um, both colleagues in civil society and local authorities ultimately just want to provide the highest possible care for people in in their corner of the country um and so any sense of where that's worked well would be great um then in terms of framing just putting a couple of things in the chat but we have found it really helpful um when talking about this to think about to recognize that lots of local authorities are under pressures to reduce the amount of money they're spending on nrpf um, like that is often the, the, the call um, and that's happening in a context where we know the burden is only going to grow and that is putting colleagues in, in impossible positions. Um, so some of the resources that we find useful is we have a um, social cost benefit analysis, which we commissioned colleagues at LSE to undertake, which just demonstrates how much money is saved long term um, by ending NRPF. Equally, um, when talking about early intervention, I really like this um, NCB report that sort of, again, gives you a number around how much money is saved by children having early access to immigration advice. Um, you've also there got our evaluation embedding immigration advice and children's services, which we work closely with SLRA on. And finally, for colleagues interested in more on the Legal Migration Act, we convened a summit last year, um, and that is just a huge page of all of the learnings from local authority colleagues and um, civil society. Um, and I guess just finally, like wherever possible, we're trying to have this conversation as a poverty issue, not just a migrant issue, um, which as we know is kind of how this has been designed to make it not relevant and not a mainstream point. Um, so sorry for that like hurricane of information, um, but yeah, there are some questions in the mix there in case anybody would like to um, either unmute or email me and I'll put my email in the chat. Thank you so much, Tamara. I'll try and pick up a couple of, of the points. Uh, first of all, the question around embedding um, a kind of expertise wider than just a key person has been raised. I have tried to somewhat capture it in the last bullet point, but by all means, please, please, please do send us comments. We certainly want all local authorities, in turn, including combined authorities, to be, to be part of it. Um, the only uh, ask is that, you know, we are trying to be as concise as possible 
uh, and, and kind of sharing links to existing. And there is a, you know, a plethora and really rich information and reporting, which is happening, from, uh, you know, from various agencies. So please, please do comment. Uh, we at City of Sanctuary are not the experts. I will admit that. So we're really looking to, to uh, partners on that. Um, so, so that's one bit. In, in terms of partnerships and legal challenges, um, at City of Sanctuary, one of the requirements to become recognized as councils of sanctuary is to set up partnership forums and escalation routes, et cetera, et cetera. I think it does help to mitigate that kind of, oh, it's us against them, you know, it's the voluntary sector against uh, local authorities, and it is working. Um, I think that there is a lot more understanding about the pressure that both the voluntary sector and local authorities uh, have. And I always say, really, when we kind of uh, award a council, we generally end up in a place where you know, the partnership, the stakeholder partnership locally feels like they are on the same team. Of course, there will always be legal challenges. And I think that this is uh, inevitable when you're dealing with human beings, but it does really help uh, with that. Uh, working together, absolutely. I mean, can, I, I know it is a really difficult uh, space and uh, to work in at the moment and really difficult time for people of migrant background generally. But I have to say we have nearly 100 people here from over about 50 or nearly 60 local authorities so it does go to sh goes to show that actually there is a lot of appetite to do this and to do it well and to go over and above uh, the minimum so I think we just need to continue to chip away at it uh, to empower one another um, and I think we are getting somewhere and hopefully with uh, I don't know with some luck I guess a new government of whatever co color will recognize that local authorities can do this they can support and uh, local residents, um, all local residents. And, and I think I genuinely feel quite positive because of what I see, notwithstanding the difficult contextual issues uh, within local government and, and the refugee sector as well. So I just wanted to end on a, a bit of a positive note. Um, I know we are all really struggling, but I think, look, the, we can we can look even just to this meeting and, and how many uh, uh, people attended looking for answers and looking uh, at how they can do things better. So just, just, Thank you, Maggie. just logistical uh, stuff. I will share, I will attempt to share everything that has been in the chat and, uh, and documents, etc., so that you can have them as resources. Um, I, I will, um, the recording, I will not put up on the website because of PEP, uh, but, um, you know, I will try and, and get things to you as soon as possible. And a really special thanks to all of our amazing experts that presented today. Um, and yes, let's continue to work together. Thank you, Maggie. And yeah, thank you to all of the speakers today. It's been amazing to have um, such expertise.